so in this case, the, we're looking at a prosecution of Bill Cosby. And most of you probably have some working familiarity with the Cosby case. The prosecution uh, wanted to show that there were women other than the victim in this case, Andrew Constant, who described very similar stories. Bill Cosby, of course, claimed his sexual relationship with Andrea Constant was consensual. She says that it was not. There were many women who claimed to have a very similar story as Andrea Constant, that Bill Cosby would invite them back to his, to his apartment or his dressing room uh, or his hotel room, and he would give them either a pill or, or something to drink and then they would wake up and realize that they had been sexually assaulted and had not consented to, to any sexual contact with Cosby. And so the question is whether the, those other stories are substantially similar enough to, to bring in under 404B's exception for, for modus operandi. The Graves case was looking at identity. We're trying to show whether whether this was the same person in Graves, uh, was the person who, who engaged in the first transaction the same person who gave, engaged in the second drug transaction. In Cosby's case, what we're trying to say is that, that there was no consent in the case with Andrea Constant because in very similar other examples, um, Cosby drugged and sexually assaulted other women so that that would lower the chance that Andrea Constant consented, lower the chance that Cosby is actually telling the truth when he offers his, his defense. But can we do it? Are those stories similar enough? Well, the court looked at the fact that there were, were five women who testified at the trial and that their stories were all remarkably similar. They all did tell these stories about pills or drink um, being given to them and then waking up later, not knowing exactly what had happened, but pretty sure that, 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 that to the extent something did happen, and, and it did in each of these cases, um, that, that they had not consented to, to any, that sort of contact with Bill Cosby. So were they similar or not? The court says yes. Uh, yes, they were. And then there's a second layer to this. Um, Cosby raises the objection on appeal that, that this character evidence, these, these five prior um, um, allegations, will cause the jury to, to rule against him on the basis of those allegations, that the, that the court has not sufficiently understood the, the, pro, the prejudicial impact of having five other people testify to these facts. And, and I think the, 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 the Pennsylvania uh, Superior Court in this case quite wisely says, well, no, wait a second, that's actually not correct because there were some 19 women willing to testify. And we know from press reports that there were about 50 who described somewhat similar circumstances. And the, the trial judge considered of the 19 who were willing to testify uh, that, that he would only allow five. And so, so who knows what the right answer is but what's I think really interesting about this case is that there's no there's no right answer to any 403 balancing test that you're going to apply. It's a standard for the trial court to use, subject to the abuse of discretion standard when it's reviewed on appeal. So very broad discretion in the trial court. But what was done very right in this case is that that the trial court said, okay, take a look at the fact that there's this 404B evidence out there whether you think it's appropriate to admit this or not, it's kind of irrelevant at this particular, for this particular point that I'm making. Let's assume it's appropriate to admit this. That's not the end of the story. Let's assume you, you believe that it's similar enough to admit, to admit. That doesn't end the inquiry. We then have to ask whether this, this evidence of, of the, other, the other complainants will overshadow this particular case and cause a conviction solely based on the priors and not the present. So there are two things going on in this case that I think work really well together. One, the fact that there were 50 act accusers other than Andrea Constant, 19 of whom were, were willing to testify, suggests that the jury really will be missing something in this particular case if they don't hear from some of them. 
that, that it's, you know, what are the odds? What truly are the odds that 50 women could falsely accuse someone of, of, of sexual assault? That Andrea Constant is the one who's lying. I mean, that's, that's, that's sort of the story here. But what if you brought all 50 in? What if you brought all 50 women in to testify? And let's say Andrea Constant's case was weak. Would we not run the risk that the jury would convict Bill Cosby, not for sexually assaulting Andrea Constant, but for sexually assaulting any number of, of the 50 women, uh, some of whom might be believed, some of whom might not. But you have to imagine that when 50 women testify, a fair number of women will absolutely be believed by the jury. So, and that's not saying anything about the underlying, underlying uh, truth of any of the allegations, just speaking like in, in hypothetical terms, even if some of them are disbelieved, at least some of them would be. And we run, we run the risk then that, that Cosby would be convicted for the priors and not the present. So however many the appropriate number is to whittle this down to, that's hard to say. There's no really good answer to that. In fact, that's very much left to the discretion of the trial judge. But what the trial judge did that, that's very right here is, in my mind, saying, yes, this, these other witnesses are absolutely relevant. How could they not be under 404B? Um, this is absolutely something the jury needs to hear. But how much of it does the jury need to hear? They probably can stand less of it and still get a, a sense of what's going on without running the absolute risk or running as high of a risk that the jury would convict on the basis of the 50 uh, rather than on how, how five or three or one or however many were chosen shed light on the story that Andrea Constant is telling. There's, there's no perfect balance there. I mean, there's no way to know what the jury actually did or thought. But I like the fact that the trial judge tried to balance those two concerns, that, that this actually is character evidence that is going to distract the jury. It's going to make them think about the past, and make them think that we ought to convict this guy of something. But at the same time, this evidence sheds a great deal of light on a, a, a he said, she, she said, much like when we look at the first aggressor question. There are, there are very few times when we um, have no real way of knowing what happened uh, in, 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 a, in a case. Uh, he said, she said in, 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 in these type of sexual assault circumstances as well as in um, mutual combat situations. Quite often in both of those, there's no other external evidence. And so we allow this evidence in, but I think the trial judge did a nice job of saying all of it would have been too much. It's, it's, it's going to in, uh, encroach on one of our principles, one way or the other, whether it's, whether it's not allowing full elucidation of the facts of this particular case by giving us the context of his life, or by allowing character evidence in that will influence how we view the present too much. One of those two things is going to happen, and we're, we're trying in an imperfect way to balance those. And I think in this case, the court did a nice job of saying, yeah, this really is very classically modus operandi uh, testimony, but, it's, but, but we can get enough of it quickly enough, at least with five.